Hello everyone and welcome on board the Sunset Safari here on Juma and Arathusa Private Game Reserves. We're in the Sabi Sands and you may have noticed a little object lying in the road. I'm not sure if you were able to make out exactly what it is, but we are going to take, and take you and have a closer look shortly. But first, my name is Scott. If you, some of you have yet to meet me, and I'm teamed up with Andrew today on camera. Brent is out on the other vehicle, and he is teamed up with, I think it's Viam, or is it Brian? I think Brian. It's Brian, and Nikki's directing the show with Tara and Kirsty lending her hand. The great news is that it's fireside chat for those of you who have forgotten. So on every Sunday for the last half an hour of the broadcast, we sit around a campfire, answer some of your questions about really anything that you'd like to know about us. So it's a bit of a different platform on which to ask questions. But we will also be discussing some of the highlights of the week. And that involved the animal that's lying up in the road ahead of us, as well as his mother and another male leopard. So it's Shadow, Tingana, and and Sindila and all the ongoings that we've seen with them mating and Shadow re rejoining with Sindila after calling for about an hour in search of him. Anyway, those will be some of the highlights. We will also be discussing the Inkahuma Pride as well as the Birmingham Boys and the Matimbas and the big cha changes in the lion dynamics that we can expect to see in the coming months. We are really in the hot zone right in the middle of this territorial war that's going on between five young males and two older ones. Anyway, let's go and take a closer look. And on the way there, you must remember that this is a live safari. So it's happening this very second and it's great to have all of you with us. But what's even better than it just being live is that you can also interact with us and send us questions and comments. And to do so is very simple, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv and that way you can ask either Brent or myself questions. We got off to a very, very, very lucky start here. And Valerie has already sent through a comment saying it's a good day when you start off with the cats. And yes, you're right, Valerie, it certainly is. We were actually on our way to go and take a closer look at, at tracks of the Inkahuma Pride. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Let's take a closer look at Sindila. He's such a beautiful young male leopard and we've been so fortunate to spend so much time with him over the last few weeks and months. Cool afternoon, about 17 degrees Celsius and 62 degree, two degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, he just attempted to catch a fly. Maybe he did. And that's why he's happy to lie out in the open. He doesn't need to seek shade as he did yesterday when it was a lot warmer. And he hasn't seen his mother now for almost 48 hours I would say the whole of yesterday she was away and she probably left him late the night before last before meeting up with Tingana I beg your pardon that's two days ago so it's at least more than 48 hours now that he's been alone Thankfully, though, he can fend for himself, albeit not nearly as well as with his mother's help, but he can catch prey, and he probably does do quite a lot of hunting without us knowing, and can sustain himself even if his mother is away for a few days. And it is also important to remember that cats can survive for five, six, seven days quite easily without a meal. As I was saying that Andrew and myself were headed off onto Arethusa, 
Stefan and myself came out for about two hours in between drive, attempting to track them. We did find tracks of them crossing from Juma into Arethusa. It looks like Junior could potentially have rejoined along with the other lioness, judging from the tracks, but it was difficult to tell. But then we ran out of time. The last tracks we had were heading down kind of towards the Arethusa Dam. So we are going to head off there a little bit later. And maybe we'll leave that decision up to you as to when we should leave young Sandile before heading off in search of the Inkahumas. A lot of the Arathu relaxed again. One thing that I forgot to mention about this evening's fireside chat is that James will be performing another one of his wonderful songs and it's actually not one of his own songs, but one of my favorite songs with some of the local African language in it. And it's going to be great singing along to him around the fire tonight. He's incredibly talented, not only in the bush, but also around the fire with the guitar. mentioned that he's been away from his mother shadow for quite some time now and Lynn has just sent through a question wondering how far away is he from where he she last left him well we don't know exactly where she did last leave him but it was roughly 500 to 600 meters to the west of us basically on the boundary of Juma and Arethusa so he hasn't actually moved very far away at all in some scenarios, he's moved surprisingly big distances without his mother. But now he seems to be content lurking around here. Wouldn't it be nice to know if her and Tangana are still mating? I haven't heard any word of that, but it certainly is possible. So he could be alone for another day or two, as leopards and lions can mate from anywhere from three to five days. Look at his little tail twitching there. Maybe there's something up ahead that's exciting him. What a stunning view this is. And I'm sure a lot of you are asking the question, is it not dangerous for him to be lying in the middle of the road and do animals ever get injured? I certainly know that Alice has sent through that very question and very seldomly do animals get run over in the Sabi Sands. Everyone tends to stick to reasonable speeds. And Alice is all the way in Ohio. We love to know where you are sending these questions from. So please make sure you add that into emails or your tweets. And we must remember, Alice, that these animals have got extremely good senses and they can hear vehicles coming. Up, coming. And I've actually watched Sindile. He's heard vehicles long before we've been able to, but his body language alerted me to look back down these long roads. And in all instances, he moved off the road long before the vehicles got anywhere close to him. It's a perfect place for him to stalk along because the road is slightly lower than the vegetation around him. And it looks like he may be using it to stalk. Let's watch closely here. Oh, this is looking good. I know we're not close by, but it's still better for us to just sit here and wait and see what happens rather than interfering. I 
I think as he gets closer, you may notice him lower his body more and more to the ground. And I wonder what it is that he's stalking up ahead there. It could be anything from a very small squirrel or mongoose to a Franklin, who knows, maybe a steenbuck or a diker. I think we can afford to creep forward a bit further without interfering. You see, that's a good example of how good the hearing and reactions are. As I start to turn on the vehicle, you got a bit of a fright. So I'm quite surprised though. And you saw him look back at us immediately. It was a squirrel, he's up in the tree. This is gonna be incredible. Watch closely. Watch here. The squirrel's in trouble. You can hear the squirrel alarming at him. He's gonna possibly try and climb up this dead marula and try and get to it. There's the squirrel. All I saw was his, tickle, his tail flicking wildly from side to side and I thought he may have caught one. But it was obviously him going around in circles chasing this poor squirrel. Will he continue or has he given up? Come on Sindile. Go and show that squirrel how agile you are. He's trying to plan a route up there. But not having much joy. You're going up the wrong tree. But this is still absolutely wonderful to see. Aren't we all so lucky? We've been saying that a lot over the last few days and it really is important, especially for the newer viewers who have only joined us recently to realize that we have been having some incredible sightings. You see, I think this squirrel doesn't have anything to worry about because it can quite comfortably get from the marula tree that it's currently in into this bush willow tree that Sindile is in. But he's going higher up. He still thinks he's got a chance. he spent many many hours hunting squirrels before oh that's risky that's a very rotten marula branch that is leaning on it's actually fallen down from the marula tree that the tree squirrels in oh this could end badly everyone get ready to get screenshots of Sindile making a fool of himself Come down from this and delay enough's enough. <laughs> it must be so frustrating for him. The squirrel hasn't moved an inch, it's still high up above him, tail flicking as it falls.
I think you certainly would be able to get up the other tree that the squirrel is in, albeit a very rotten marula. I don't think he would have any trouble getting up there. I think the only catch is that once he does go up there, the squirrel is just going to jump across with absolute ease into the other tree. So it's great to see him trying this hard. What may happen is that the squirrel, the squirrel may panic and run down and leave the marula tree. And if and when it does do that, like now it may go down and try and move to another tree. And that may give Sindile an opportunity to jump down onto the ground and chase it down. Look at the tails of the squirrel. It reminds me of those small toys that you would get in Lucky Packets with sweets that you blow at birthdays and at Christmas. <laughs> so it's a little bit easier for him going up now. Coming down is going to be interesting. Let's see what his next moves are. Is he going to try and get up this marula tree? Now, it will be very interesting to see if he does try and climb up this marula tree. Like I said, it's very rotten and the bark is bound to break off as he tries to climb up. No luck this time, but we'll be more than happy for you to keep trying. I think he's realized this is not going to be a useful opportunity to continue pursuing. And luckily he's heading back into Juma. Everything on the left we can access, but on the right we cannot. So, oh, interestingly enough, I've seen a whole colony of dwarf mongooses that he's heading directly towards on a termite mound in the distance. And as Andrew zooms across, you will see that there's a large termite mound up to the left of your screen and there's a whole family of dwarf mongooses looking on intently so we are going to start to hear their alarm calls if he continues in their direction he's looking back longingly at the squirrel now who is the proud victor of this battle well done little squirrel and he escaped the stealth of a leopard. I've just heard the first alarm call ring out from the dwarf mongooses and that's what stopped him and caused him to cock his head off to the right. Wow. I wonder what his next quarry will be. I think he may very well continue to entertain us this afternoon, but it looks like he may be taking a short break. The squirrel is not finished with the alarm calls yet and wants to allow, allow everyone in the area to know of this potential threat, but it just very narrowly escaped.
<laughs> well, very good to hear that Connie, Vicky and Debbie all sent through some interesting comments about how funny this has been and poor old Sindila mentioning one of the things was that he's brought all these people along to see him making a fool of himself but we can certainly forgive him because he is a youngster and catching a tree squirrel is not an easy thing to do. They're incredibly agile and so small and fast and it's not to say that it is not possible for the leopard to catch it, but we must remember that all of the prey that they go after is usually a failure, even when the predators are adults. Let's try and get a bit closer. And enjoy some views of him recovering from that squirrel making an absolute fool of him. But all very, very useful training. It's going to be as good as we get for now. There's quite a few other branches obstructing him if we were to move around. So not very close, but still close enough to have a closer look. So enjoy. The flies are beginning to give him a hard time. Just like earlier we saw him snap out at one. Well, is it time for a siesta after your hunt? It could well be. Well, for those of you who are new to the Safari Live show, one thing that we sometimes forget to mention is that cats spend incredibly long periods of each day asleep. Anywhere from 16 to 20 hours is the average amount of sleep that a cat will enjoy to have on a daily basis. So those little glimpses of magic like we've just witnessed are few and far between, especially during the daylight hours. It's important to realize what a great start we've got off to here. I don't actually ever see, think I've seen him climbing a tree very well. Other than the first time I saw him, when he was about half the size he is now, I think that was in March. He was very small and there was some hyena below the tree that his mother had hoisted a kill into it was an impala, a small impala, and I think that's what allowed her to hoist it up there because it wasn't too big for her. And hyenas caught wind of the kill and he was stuck up a knobthorn acacia for I think it was three full days without coming down. But I didn't actually get to see him climbing and he was a lot smaller so that was a great first for me with this specific leopard. You'll notice the squirrel has yet to stop calling. You can hear a brown crown chagra calling off in the distance, but it may be a bit far for the mics to pick up.
I'm just taking you across to get a glimpse of the dwarf monguses that are keeping on him. Well, we've just got a question through from Cecilia and Maryland. Good to have you with us, Cecilia. Cecilia is interested to know what is more dangerous for Sindile, lions or other leopards? It's a tricky question to answer. Both male leopards that did not father Sindile and lions will equally try to kill him and eliminate him from this ecosystem. Male leopards will do so so that they can release shadow of his responsibility and therefore she'll come into season soon and they can mate with her. So that would be their goal and reason behind killing Sindile. Male or, male or female lions would also both kill him and that's simply to eliminate competition. Now at this age he is still under threat from male leopards and they would still kill him. So it's, it's probably equal and I don't think you'd be able to sway either way because there are just so many variables. In some cases though I have, have heard that male leopards will kill more young leopards than any other animal. So it's male leopards that are the primary threat to young cubs. So I think they are equally dangerous but the benefits I guess he has is that by now he can climb trees quite well and therefore escape lion whereas he will not be able to escape a male leopard. So that is why I guess a male leopard would therefore be more dangerous to him than lion. Lion he still has a very good chance of escaping from as they are terrible climbers. Okay, well let's see if we can reposition again. We don't have the best view from here. Okay. just received my first question from somebody as young as four years of age. Hello young Isabella and I'm so happy to hear you watching the safari and also that you got to see this young leopard climbing up in that tree earlier. Now folks, every, Isabella would like to know, will young leopards ever fall out of trees or are they too good a climber not to? Isabella, they certainly do fall out of trees sometimes, not very often, but they do, especially when they're young and quite bold, they take chances, and it's often rotten logs that look quite big and strong that they jump onto, that give way and the leopard and the log go flying down to the ground. I thought that may happen a bit earlier when he was resting on that fallen marula branch that was in the other tree that he was climbing in. And maybe in the next year or 18 months, and that's how long I think we will still see him fall, we will get to see him fall out of a tree. Not that we want him to, but I think it could well happen because we are going to be able to spend so much time with him hopefully.
Isabella, I have also once seen a monkey falling out of a tree. So if monkeys who are very good tree climbers can fall out, then you can certainly imagine that a leopard will also sometimes make the wrong move. Well, earlier Cecilia was asking whether lions or leopards pose a greater threat to young leopards and we discussed that a little bit and now we've just got another question through from Linda and Linda's interested to know while he is alone what are his biggest challenges when his mother's away off hunting what will he need to worry about the most and I guess keep himself busy doing in order to keep safe good question Linda I don't think he has too many challenges, more so than when he is with his mother. He will still be alert when he's with his mother. And what he may, what may be his biggest challenge in these next few days that he could be away alone while his mother's away mating is possibly to keep himself full bellied, not full bellied, but keep himself content. So I think the likelihood of him trying to hunt will increase as he becomes more hungry. So that may, may be one challenge that he faces. Other than that though, they are very hardy animals and can survive with, with food, without food for quite some time and also without water. So I guess his biggest challenge is to just keep himself busy and out of trouble. Okay, well as I said earlier, Brent is also out with Brian and they are wanting to say hello to all of you, so we will not be going anywhere and we'll call you as soon as Sindile makes his next move. Welcome on the Sunset Safari everyone. Uh, my name is Brent and I have Brian on camera with me at this Sunset Safari and we're sitting with a breeding herd of elephant and at the moment we've got a cow and a young male calf in front of us and there are others spread out through the thickets around us and hopefully they're going to move out into the open a little bit but while we're here you can see the female feeding off a nice big acacia here and the little guy is just about to start testing out his trunk and you can just see it as he's trying to sort of get involved with mom's feeding even though he's very much dependent on mother's milk at the moment and probably doesn't have full function in his trunk yet still learning how to use it properly but they learn by playing and that's what he's doing at the moment fiddling and trying to get, use his trunk to grab little bits of leaf and that but he hasn't quite got the coordination yet And for those of you who are, might be new viewers or wondering what this is, we are on a live African safari and you are seeing these elephants at the same time Brian and I am and also we are interactive so you can ask us questions and you can do that by emailing us wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag safari live on Twitter. So, as I said a bit earlier, the rest of the herd is still in the thickets and haven't moved through into the open yet. I'm sure they might. I can hear them moving all around us. There's one coming through from the drainage line there. It looks like a young bull. And if he comes up next to this female like he might, she, we might be able to see the difference in head shape. Or well, she doesn't look very comfortable with this young bull coming around. She immediately sort of just moved her head a little bit. And as I said, looks like he might be harassing her at the moment. Actually, 
that is just a very very big female you can see the head shape there is still quite angular she's just a very large bodied female and probably in terms of uh, the hierarchy of the the herd she's probably more dominant and that's why that other female sort of moved off quite quickly and sort of gave this female with those very very long tusks right of way you can see how thin those tusks are and that's another way to see the females the male if he had tusks that length would be much much thicker but she's just an incredibly big female and there's a little calf probably just between a year and year and a half and two years coming up out of the drainage line to join her and he's just you'll see him there we go coming through there we go coming to join and you'll see that the trunk there is far more dexterous and he's got sort of control of it the elephants have these incredible feet and the, st elef the structure of an elephant's foot is very interesting so it's almost conical and they do have five toes but this very big spongy mass and you can see the toenails there on the toes but they're not as you would expect they actually come from higher and you can see that shape in the foot there and Junebug from Dallas is wondering do the elephants use their feet to feel vi vibrations well Junebug I don't think so I think they definitely rely on their hearing most of all and they can hear in decibels much lower than and higher than we can and I think that's what they'll rely on and even with the vibrations and stuff you probably find they might pick it up with their ears rather than their feet so I've never heard of them using their feet to pick up vibrations before but speaking about the decibels that an elephant can hear quite an interesting little fact is that I'm sure there's a few of you out there who are big fans of Jurassic Park and most of the dinosaur noises the velociraptors the t-rexes all those scary sounds they make are slowed down or speeded up elephant noises now, elephants have a vast array of noises they can make from trumpeting to screaming to almost growling gurgling purring so they do have a quite a vast vocal array and hollywood has used that many times for different things and and probably never with elephants if you watch some of those wonderful old Hollywood movies uh, Mugambo and King Solomon's Mines um, the Hollywood directors and producers there weren't so worried about being real to what is actually there and you will often find those African movies set in Africa uh, will have Indian elephants in them as opposed to African elephants let me go you can see that little guy probably about two years old now I can see him next to mom looked like he was heading in for a drink So you can see that this group of females seem to have particularly wonderful long sets of ivory. And you can see there that female there, really wonderful long ivory. And Donna also noticed that there are quite a few cows in this group that have long tusks. It'll be interesting to see the rest. And uh, Cecilia was wondering whether they're, they're pregnant. Unfortunately not Cecilia. You can see that one who's in frame at the moment. The little elephant directly next to it that is almost definitely her youngster as it was trying to suckle earlier and the other female to the left of those there we go you can see them just behind the tree there and you can see her calf right next to her there so i don't think any of these are pregnant and the others are a bit young so that there we go there those wonderful tusks
They eat a vast amount of vegetable matter in a day. A big elephant bull can eat up to sort of 200 plus kilograms of vegetable matter. And now that we're in the dry season, most of that vegetable matter will be made up of trees and bushes. Sorry guys, just getting an update on the radio. I'll be with you in a second. Sorry guys, I'm just listening to the radio. Um, there is an update on an animal we don't see too often, so I'm just going to listen for a second. Okay guys, don't worry, it was a bit of confusion, um, a word was misunderstood on the radio, so someone thought there were cheetah around, but there aren't, um, so it's just a little bit of misunderstanding there, and caused a bit of pandemonium in my ear for a second. So it's something we don't see too often, and, and elephants do do it from time to time, uh, but Wendy from Florida, sunny, sunny Florida, full of alligators and whatnot, uh, is, was wondering, what does it mean when an elephant is tusking the ground? Um, you'll generally see them doing it in clay banks, and they will be looking for different minerals or salts from, from, the, from the ground, and that's what they do when they're tusking the ground. So if we have a look at that female with those nice long tusks, you can see her legs across there and Lucy, one of our regulars from South Bend in Indiana, um, said she didn't realize that elephants crossed their legs so much when they were feeding. Well Lucy, it looks quite comfortable and I'm sure that's the reason they do it. Uh, same reason uh, we would cross our legs while we were sitting or resting, so I think it's just, just a comfort thing, I don't think there's any particular reason for them doing it apart from the fact that it's probably very comfortable. So it's always a very peaceful, well not always, but it is very nice when you do find a nice big peaceful herd like this and you are able to just sit quietly and enjoy spending time with these magnificent animals. I've been very fortunate in my years in the bush to have spent a lot of time with elephants. and uh, Not only these savannah elephants that we're looking at now, but with forest elephants 
I've even seen them on the beach in Gabon in Central Africa. So if we look at these two adult females as Brian pans across, uh, Deborah from Ontario in Canada. Hopefully you guys are having a nice warm summer in Ontario. Uh, you will notice that the hips seem to be quite protruding quite a bit compared to some of the younger ones. And Deborah's wondering whether it's lack of food or age. I would say it's probably age, judging both these females are, are quite old. I would say the one on the left is a bit older. I'm just going to try to sneak forward a little bit so we can have a look at her. Always very important to let the engine idle for a little bit before you move around elephants. You don't want to give them any sudden surprises. Now we can have a look at the others a bit better. Um, so if we have a look at this female to the left, I would say she's the elder of the two, even though her tusks aren't as long. Um, some of the, the telltale sounds, if we look at her head, uh, specifically above her eye, you'll see those depressions start to really, really sink in. And if we look at her shoulder as well, you can see it is really sticking out and her skin is looking a little bit baggy on her. So I think that is age. She's probably on her last set of teeth now. And having a young calf like that, this would probably be her last calf. So also very dry year. Having a young calf would also put added stress on her. So it could be a, a combination of age and well, definitely an age and not getting enough nutrients, but the nutrients is completely combined with the age being on her last set of teeth. She probably won't be able to get as much out of her meals as she used to. And elephants are incredibly poor at digesting what they do eat. And they only successfully digest about 40% of their food. That's why they have to eat such a vast amount on a daily basis. And that combined with their huge size. So, discussing tusks as we were a little bit earlier, they're just such a pity we can't see. Uh, if we go underneath this female, we might just be able to make out the little tushes on that ele young elephant behind. But Dr. Debbie was wondering, can you tell the age of an elephant by sort of the tusks coming out? And you can, the first sort of set of visible tucks comes out just after a year. But after that it can be very difficult as each individual elephant has a very different growth pattern for their, for their tusks. That poor acacia has been absolutely decimated at the moment. But even though it looks like the elephants cause a lot of damage, I'm quite sure that tree will bounce back during the rainy season and it'll be very, sometimes actually very difficult to see that the elephants have even fed.
and we have our Drongo friend here and we had a, quite a nice discussion about Drongos and why we often find them around the animals we're viewing and sometimes they even just follow us so a nice big animal like an elephant will disturb quite a lot of different insects as they feed and the Drongos here to take advantage of any unsuspecting poor grasshopper or, dra or damselfly or whatnot that might take off uh, to get away from where the elephants are feeding. I can actually see there's probably about, I can see two from where I am now, but I can hear another couple around where the other ellies are. So a fork-tailed drongo. If you can hear that crunching, guys. You can hear, I just, just way in the distance, I can hear other elephants actually screaming and so obviously a little altercation going on with those ones We're having a wonderful sighting with this group of savannah elephants and Jimlin from Oklahoma would like to know is there are there any very big noticeable differences between Indian forest well, I think that if I remember correctly they're no longer called Indian elephants I think they're called Asiatic elephants now but Asiatic elephants African savannah elephants and African forest elephants so quite they are very very much so and we'll stick to the Africans for, oh, well, let's start with the Indian actually um, the Indian elephants are, are physically much smaller uh, quite a lot less uh, of them have tusks it's actually more common to have Indian elephants without tusks and also their skin and stuff is a they get a very strange pinky shape or pinky color on their heads and on their skin uh, and their head shape is also completely different uh, best way to go have a look is if you guys have the availability to go onto the internet and just google and have a look but now the I'll chat definitely a bit more about the forest elephants and the and the African savannah elephants so they were long thought to be a completely different species um, this is not however true uh, they are a sort of so if they were a completely different species, they wouldn't be able to mate and produce reproductive offspring. And they are able to. It is a slightly different variation of the savannah elephant that has some evolved some adaptions for living in those very thick Central African rainforests. So they are physically a lot smaller. I mean, this big cow we're looking at here would be an enormous forest elephant bull uh, I mean absolutely enormous be one of the biggest body sized forest elephant bulls around but the cows and the females there are probably a little bit bigger than this one to the left uh, probably sort of halfway up that big cow uh, so they are quite small in comparison and weigh a lot less but also their head shape is quite different they all have very rounded heads and their tusks tend to go vertically down and that is a very smart thing if you are living in a very thick area like a rain rainforest because if you had upward curving tusks like that you would have a big problem because I'm getting hooked in the very thick bush
and I have a picture comparing the two elephant species if and another difference between the two is the trunk um, the tip of the trunk but in between but that will stick with the forest there we go let's go to this one first so those are your two African variants Loxodonta africana which is this one or sometimes referred to as Loxodonta africana africana and that is the savannah elephant like we're looking at there that is a bull in that picture you can see by the shape of the head much more rounded less angular than the cows and there we have Loxodonta africana cyclotis and that is the forest elephant their eye color is also quite different they have a very distinct orange eye on the forest elephants and you can see how the tusks face down rather than curving upwards and that's to enable them to move through the forest is more easily and these little prehensile tips on the elephant's trunk on both African species they have two prehensile tips on the Asiatic elephant they only have one little prehensile tip so we're still speaking about elephants and now we've got into the Loxodonta or the Latin or, or the scientific name for the African elephant. I was wondering who out there is able to tell me what Loxodonta africana means. We know it's an elephant, but what does it mean? Uh, you can send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What does Loxodonta africana mean? We've just been discussing different elephants and uh, Sharon from New Jersey, welcome on the Sunset Safari Sharon. Sharon would like to know why are some elephants red? Well Sharon it's, a com uh, it's completely to do with the area they live in and it's probably because they've had a red mud bath or dust bath. It's the only reason an elephant would be red. I'm sure if you had a good m spray of water he, would, he or she would definitely then become grey. I've seen very white elephants because of white mud in the Mekhari Khari salt pans in Botswana but and after a good rain shower or a bathe in the river they do become grey again. So you guys, it's going to be on the radio for a second. I just need to let the other guys know where these elephants are. There's also a Shambi of Love just to the west of Cheetah Cut Line Junction with Gary Main. Oh, I see a tiny little baby over there, so we're going to move around, see if we can have a look at a very small one. Brian might be able to catch you a gap through that bush there, but we're going to see if we can move around. That little baby's just behind its mom there. Yeah, behind the branch. Behind the branch. Mm -hmm. Again, you'll notice I always let the car run for a little bit before moving. Just a very good practice you could do with all animals. Um, and it does help them relax more around vehicles and not rush off and get a fright. Because imagine how disconcerting, something there's this brrr, and then you start crashing around. It's always good to just start, let the engine rev for a little while, not to upset the animals, and then move after a couple of seconds, or probably a bit longer, or a bit shorter than what I do now. And let's go see if we can have a look at that tiny one.
so I'll try C. Oh, sorry. Oh, so upset. A young female got a little bit upset there. They have us a nice little trumpet. But again, when that happens with elephants, you judge the reaction of the adults, not the youngsters. And if the adults reacted to her trumpeting, uh, then they would probably cause to stay back and move along. But because they didn't, they just carried on feeding. I uh, think she's probably a bit of a drama queen. So obviously with a massive animal like a, an elephant, it has very few natural predators. And Hilma from the Netherlands was wondering, do we ever find elephants? That have died of natural causes and what happens to them. I'm just gonna try. Elmo, I'm gonna be with you in a second. I just wanna get us into this little guy here. Hello, little boy. There we go. I'm gonna run to mom and he might come back uh, to pretend how big and brave he is after he's got sufficient courage from being close to mother. So, Helmer. That is mostly how elephants do die, is from old age. Their last set of... ...old age, their last set of teeth uh, gets worn down and they're unable to get enough nutrients from their feeding. They will often, and it will often, especially in dry years, it can make that situation go on a little bit faster. I'm just gonna roll forward again a tiny bit. There we go. And you can see the little guy. And Hilma would also like to know then what happens to them. Do we just leave them be or do we step in or, or what happens? Well, Helmer, what happens is we are in a natural system and as sad as it might seem to some people, we don't interfere. Uh, what happens quite often is they will die of, of starvation, but basically because their last set of teeth is run out. In some circumstances, lions and hyenas will find them before they are di uh, dead, but are severely weakened and will actually start feeding on them while they are alive. Uh, and obviously that is, can be a very disturbing thing to watch. But it is nature, so we don't interfere. And slowly but surely that whole carcass will be utilized by different predators and scavengers. And, oh, there we go, having a drink. Quite a young female, I'd say, probably, probably her first calf. And... Eventually the bones will just be scattered through the bush, like with any other animal. Uh, jean -Dre and I found a big elephant leg bone on safari a, f a while ago while we are following those two male cheetah. So they do die occasionally, but you must also remember elephants are very long-lived. Um, they can live to about 65 years old. So you don't find them falling over and flopping over dead too often, uh, but it is possible. So we had a little chat quickly about the Latin or the scientific name for an elephant, Loxodonta africana, and very well done to Jimelin and Debbie, who got that spot on. Uh, Loxa is long, Donta is teeth, and Africana is of Africa. 
So the scientific name for elephant means long teeth of Africa. So very well done guys. And as these ellies disappear down into the drainage line and continue on their feeding foray, we are going to send you off back to Young Sindile with Scott and we'll be back with you a little bit later in the show. Welcome back everyone and it sounds like you've had a wonderful sighting of elephants with Brent and great that there are quite a few elephants around at the moment they come and go young Sindile has not moved an inch since you left us and as you can see is fast asleep and enjoying a break after his unsuccessful tree squirrel hunt during that hunt the squirrel was alarming very loudly and very intensely as you all got to hear and that could possibly attract other predators into the area to see what is going on and we got a question through from Itch Ful Yun in South Africa and he said that we try not to interfere and affect whatever would be happening out here as if we are not even around and he therefore said well how would we do that if like I just said predators were other predators were attracted to the alarm calls while we were parked there it's obviously it's not something that you can really plan for but we will try and best either get out of the way if one predator may be using our vehicle as a barrier to sneak up on Sindile and certainly if possible you keep your engine off because hearing is also a very important aid that they can use to hear things approaching them there will from time to be time to time be absolute freak occurrences where I guess a vehicle may have a negative impact on what would have naturally happened but it's certainly nobody's intent and What's important to remember that is that without these animals being viewed there's very little way to create revenue to protect them and this is a prime example of that. The Sabi Sands is privately owned land and it can look after itself and maintain itself because people come here and pay to protect this land and therefore the animals within it and without seeing wild animals it's often those ones that are least protected so the very small impact that we may have through default from time to time does certainly not forego the benefits that we bring by being able to show people these animals I certainly hear you though there could be a freak scenario where we did get in the way but most of the time we can avoid it and certainly do our best Two, nobody would like to be responsible for the death of any other animal out here. So I hope that answers your question, Itch. And good to know you're watching. Haven't had a question from you before. We've got the same question that's come through from Helen in New York and John in Scotland. So even though you're on different continents, you're thinking on the same wavelength. And they would like to know, will Shadow come back into this area to collect Sindile once she's finished mating? Or will she come back sooner than that? My guess is that she will finish mating with Tingana. And... As much as she may want to come back to Sindile before she's finished mating with him, which could take three to five days, so another two more days, or at least another day from now, it would be difficult for her to lure Tingana here. And basically she now is being taken on a tour of his territory as he continues to check and mark his territory. She will just slot behind him. He's not going to follow her. And that's what 
caused her to head so far east into Juma. We've never seen her that far east. Not to say she hasn't been there, but we certainly haven't seen her that far until she started mating with Tingana recently. And he still looks very healthy. I'm sure two more days, even without a meal, he'll be fine. And that's not to say that he won't catch something for himself. Who knows? She could arrive here in the next five or ten minutes. But I'm guessing it's still going to be a bit longer. Now, the tricky thing is, is whether to leave Sindile now and head across to Arethusa, where the Inkahuma pride has been found. All seven of them are together, so they did reunite last night. Or do we stay here with the sleepy leopard? I'm guessing both animals are going to be asleep, but there's no way of being sure which one will provide the most action. But I am sure a lot of you would like to see all seven of the Inkahumas together, so send us your thoughts. What has Andrew spotted here? A little bird. He's testing me. Oh, it's another chin spot batters, those of you who are around a couple of days ago. We spent quite a lot of time watching these chin spot batters. What has Sundile seen? Uh, it's a very, very small bird hopping in the grass. And that's why he's lost focus again. Back to sleep. So send us your thoughts as I was saying. Do we stay or do we go to the Inkahuma Pride? They're probably about 10 to 15 minutes away. I'm still going to have to get onto the Arethusa game drive channel and there may be quite a few vehicles already interested in that sighting so it's not necessarily as easy as just going across there and slotting right in we may have to get onto the vehicle lineup which means the sooner we get there the better anyway send us through your thoughts and help make the, de the decision as to what we shall be doing next certainly not bad options either one of them Even though we got to see him hunting earlier, we've yet to ever capture him successfully catching something. But what we do know, and I know Danny would like to know this, is what is his biggest prey that he's caught? Well, it's a tie-up between a crested Franklin, which is the one prey species that he caught, and a dwarf mongoose. So those are the only two confirmed kills that we know he's made, both very small. But that's not to say he hasn't caught something bigger in his life. And then another question from Joan, wondering will he start to hunt bigger prey with his mother? And no, it's very unlikely that they will hunt together. And I'm sure the first time he catches an impala or a steenbuck or anything large it will be when he's on his own oh uh, sorry Paula in Virginia I think I got the wrong name there Okay, well, thanks for making up the plans for the rest of the safari. Well, not the rest necessarily, but the next leg of the safari. We are going to continue now. So say goodbye to Sindile. And all of you want us to head off to the Inkahumas. Sorry, boy. But we have been spending lots of time with you, and we haven't seen the Inkahumas recently. And we will make sure they're nowhere nearby you giving you a hard time. Like I said, it's about 10 or 15 minutes before we get there. I saw Andrew, it looked like he was almost about to fall off the back of the vehicle there. Like a scuba exit off the side of a boat. 
but he recovered, thankfully. Just want to get a hold of Aubrey quickly. He said he was coming here a long time ago, and I don't know where he is. Aubrey, Aubrey. Aubrey, are you still coming to this ingway? Well, he's decided to go off and see Mvula instead, a large male leopard who we haven't seen for quite some time, and that's because Tingana, the leopard who's been mating with Shadow, is pushing deeper into Mvula's territory, and it appears like Mvula is giving way to him. Tingana, on the other hand, is getting pressure from the Anderson male, who in turn is pushing into Mvula, and Anderson is the youngest, then Tingana, then Mvula, so... The youngsters are proving the most powerful amongst the dominant males that we see. And Mvula is on Cheetah Plains, which is a little bit, uh, probably two or three miles east of Juma's eastern boundary. The update was is that the Inkahuma Pride are somewhere around the large open area in front of Arathusa camp. And when myself and Steph were tracking them between drive today, we spent about two hours tracking them. Their last direction before we had to turn off was heading down towards the dam. So that does make sense. And they certainly had us on a run around this morning and midday. The tracks actually cross the road just up ahead there where my finger is. And then continued south and west from there. But we're very seldomly walking along a road which makes for difficult tracking. Thankfully, Steph was on fire today and finding most of the tracks. It's also tricky in this overcast weather because you can't see the tracks very clearly on the ground. Sunny conditions are far better, or at least late afternoon or early morning sunshine. When the sun's directly above you, it acts just like the overcast weather. It creates flat light. And now I need to switch over to the Arethusa channel. Oh, that wasn't very smooth. And any station, copy me. Good afternoon. I can't copy you very clearly. It's Scott here. I'm interested in the Inkahuma Gala. I'll just slowly make my way to Safari Open and get a clearer update when I'm nearby. Okay, copy that, thank you very much. Well, it's a bumpy road and I'm going to hurry along. I've been told we can head straight there. So rather than you getting bumped around all the way there, we're going to send you across to Brent for an update. Enjoy and we'll see you later with the Inkahuma Pride. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we got some really exciting news earlier today. Um, Steph was out uh, testing some of that walking equipment and he managed to find the new hyena den but obviously they, when they saw him they ran off 
So what we're trying to do now is we're going to slowly make our way towards that area and see if we can maybe have a look at the den and see if there's some hyenas there. Very cool and cold overcast afternoon. Lots of cloud cover. Been chilly all day. We even had a spot of drizzle in the middle of the day, but fortunately it stayed away for the safari. over Africa I've been very fortunate in the way I've grown up and where I've worked and Heidi is asking if I've ever been to Namibia Heidi I actually lived in Namibia for a little bit uh, but not on the desert side in the wet side on the in the Caprivi strip and uh, I was a fly fishing guide on a place called Impalila Island uh, for quite a couple of months so I lived there in Namibia I've also spent quite a lot of time in the as I said in the Caprivi strip uh, fishing on the Okavango, Kwando, and Zambezi rivers. I haven't really got through to the dry side yet, so I've been in that little top sliver of Namibia called the Kapibi Strip, and it's quite an interesting little piece of land. Uh, from if you go back to colonial times, it sort of make if any of you out there grab a just Google Namibia and see if you can get a map of Namibia and you'll see it's this very strange little finger that goes along between Angola and Botswana and it does it looks like it's sort of an add-on to a country or a, 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 a fall behind a forget me a sort of a, a, a late addition sorry is the, what I'm looking for and that's because it is I'm just trying to remember my history correctly now but uh, it was traded that little sliver of land was traded to Namibia by the British because Namibia before World War One was a German colony and it was traded to the British and I'm trying to remember what the British traded they gave them uh, the Germans that and they got an island somewhere I could be I can't remember where it was but it was a very strategic island yeah somewhere out in the ocean that the British really wanted and the person who brokered this whole whole deal was a, a German count by the name of Count Caprivi and pretty much the British laughed all the way home after that deal I just can't remember what they traded it for but basically the British negotiators managed to convince Fort Caprivi that the Zambezi was going to be saleable to the Indian Ocean so they wanted to, the Germans wanted to link the Atlantic and the, and the Indian Ocean and they sort of had pictures of putting steamboats and going down uh, the Zambezi all the way through Portuguese East Africa which is now Mozambique and onward into the Indian Ocean as a sort of made possible shortcut um, for their Spice Island trade but what the British just failed to tell the Germans or they just admitted is that probably not even by, by water it's about maybe 150 kilometers there's a, a little a little problem if you're on a sailboat just guys I'm just gonna get past the water pump it's quite loud and then I'll finish the story good old Lister engine making sure that we can have a shower at home so back to our Mr. Fort Count Caprivi uh, and so the British admitted and didn't tell the Germans that probably about 150 kilometers from, 
from where, well, I suppose if you take it from the Caprivi, from Impalila Island down, uh, there's a very large problem if you're on a, on a steamboat or any type of boat, and it's called Victoria Falls. Uh, forget the Kasani Rapids, uh, the Kariba Gorge, Koboa Bassa Gorge. There was literally no way possible the Germans could send anything down the Zambezi to the Indian Ocean without it being destroyed. So Count Caprivi apparently never set foot.